it was a good life, the uh, Australian Army, and we had very, very nice and very gentlemanly and polished officers in our battalion. We were very fortunate. But uh, so we sort of just went on with with what was uh, going when we went to Pukapungal. That was a, a very bad time for a lot of the chaps. We got we got uh, very bad cold because there was no no uh, warmth in the area at all, and they were Nissen huts, tin huts. So they would freeze in the night, but that we overcame all that, and when we got on the, the ship to go overseas. That was a, a, in itself. That that was an experience that only people in the army could uh, would, would ever experience it. When we were going uh, in, in the Indian Ocean, well, there was a lot of boxing between the second sixteenth, which came on the ship in uh, Fremantle. We had a lot of boxing and right through until we got to uh, Bombay. Uh, then of Bombay, we, we went north up into the hinterland a little for a few days. But it, in, the, the, in the Palestine, it was very peaceful country, Palestine, uh, and we had time there to enjoy the, uh, the life of the Palestinians. The, uh, then, of course, into, the, uh, into Africa, the formation of some of the desert things, you go up 150 feet on a 15 or 25 degree angle and then walk across the top of that, that plateau of sand which has formed over thousands of years and then down the other side, well, one of our chaps had a boy's anti-tack rifle and he threw the rifle down when we walked across the plateau section. And then we had another, say, a, a five-mile journey to get to our positions in, uh, near the Mediterranean Sea and near Libya, the Lib Libyan border. Uh, it was, that was very entertaining in that uh, our officers would ask uh, us to, to try out this, this anti-tank gun we were out, out of the desert a bit, and uh, uh, Mr. Doctor, at least I should say, Captain W. G. A. Landale, he was our captain at that time. He asked us to shoot at rocks on the sand down near the, the water with this boy's anti tank gun. Well. Uh, the chap that had it was uh, Bentley and he said, Bentley, get down there and hit those rocks down there with a shot. The, the Bentley fired the rifle and he got thrown about three or four feet away from the rifle. And uh, then uh, Bill Landell said to me, Smith, you get down, do better than that. So I, I had a shot at these rocks and it, it gave me a, a big jolt, and Bill said, I'll, get the, I'll go and have a shot now. Well, he had it, and it hit him on the jaw, and uh, we looked down the barrel, and the barrel was bent. <laughs> that was, a, you know, those sort of things happened during your time in the Army, which was quite entertaining at the time. Of course, the officers didn't like to be made fun of, as I said before, they were, they were gentlemanly people and they they appreciated a joke, but when it bounced on, then it wasn't so good. 
But uh, after that time, and uh, we we were in an area where prisoners of war had uh, been taken. Uh, there was a section uh, when we came across on the uh, train of about oh, 20,000 Italians had been captured and they were in behind uh, uh, these uh, concrete crosses. They, at the end of each line they had put up concrete crosses and uh, they were... Uh, one of our chaps was very, very religious and he didn't like these Italians going down near the, uh, the crosses and poking their tongues out at us. <laughs> and, uh, that, and he got out, our, got out the brain gun and fired a few shots where their kits were and the kits flew everywhere, of course. They stopped the train immediately and went along to find out where the hot barrels were, but they never ever found out where it, where it was our barrel because they just chained the barrels over. But, uh, that, was, that caused a bit of a stir, that did, that, that particular trip on the train. Uh, later, of course, the, the, tr the train went further west and uh, we were t our positions, which we took over from the second uh, battalion of the Scots Guards. Now, my son has just spent time. Every dugout had things left by the Scots Guards, and I grabbed a uh, a brush, a, a clothes brush, and it had a stamp of a, a number on it. Now, my son has just found out that that was, uh, belonged to a Scots guard and that he's traced it back now. He was captured by the Germans, that Scott guard, in one of the advances. Uh, but uh, he, he did live through the war and then after the war he joined another section. Uh, but uh, that's getting away from the story of mine. <coughs> But uh, we, uh, we had a, a trip back uh, to, uh, towards Alexandria and on that trip back there, were, there was a place, Aking Maru. Now, the English had all these different nationalities in that. There was... Uh, there, there was uh, Czechoslovakians, Yugoslavs. Uh, there was some, uh, some people from, uh, say, Estonia, and and uh, the each section had their little flag up of that particular nation that they were representing. But it's amazing how the British. Uh, controlled all this sort of thing peacefully. Uh, they mostly got Australian bully beef there uh, to eat and, and Australian biscuits. But uh, we didn't have time to ever talk with them. But just going back on the train and past all these, these sections was really interesting to think that Britain could accommodate and all these different nationalities that were anti-German uh, and uh, well, keep the peace within them. It wasn't all peaceful, I know that, but it, most of it was peaceful. We did never ever hear any record otherwise until after the war. But uh, we then went up to northern uh, Palestine to a place called a Fuhrer, which I have mentioned before, that uh, that was seven miles from uh, from Haifa and seven miles from uh, Nazareth, we and, and other places like that. Where well, we walked to those places, of course, uh, when we 
we were free to do so. Uh, at that, in that area, some of our chaps' wives had babies, and of course, I went into Haifa and had a a, a stint of a, a beer, Australian beer. We got by that that time. The initial beer there was Eagle beer, which was a uh, brewed in in uh, Palestine and the water wasn't good. So Carlton United set up there and they even bought water over to make beer, which tasted like Australian beer. But uh, that was another thing that did happen in the Middle East, which was good for the Aussies because I didn't drink much myself, but some of the chaps always tried to have a bottle in their hand until they uh, they made the lady blamey glass. They used to cut the glasses in half and, and use them to drink out of instead of out of the bottle. They were called lady blameys, those, those glasses, and they were terrible to drink out of because the edges were, weren't ground off nice and smoothly. But uh, we, from there, of course, we went into uh, uh, Palest Palestine to uh, Lebanon. Now, at the start of that, uh, there was a, a Latani River divided Palestine and, uh, and Lebanon. Well, that was the first real uh, bad part of uh, the war, the uh, French were there and they were making things difficult for us. Uh, it's a funny thing with the French nation, how they were divided between the uh, British and German, but uh, nearly everyone in, in the Lebanon were pro-German pro in that, that they all wanted to get back to uh, Marseille, rather than be uh, under the uh, uh, well, the auspices of the of the British nation, uh, twenty two thousand went back to Marseille, and only five thousand to uh, Damascus, and those five thousand were pro British. There are areas there that were quite, you know, mosquito infested. And uh, that was just uh, north, north of uh, Tripoli. There's a Tripoli in, in Lebanon also. And uh, from there we went into a, 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 it had been a French hospital and it was a 12-day uh, serve of Atterburn and Plasmaquin to try and alleviate the malaria. And uh, from there we went up to a place called Dow El Shuey. Now that was a magnificent hotel uh, north of uh, uh, Tripoli, up towards the Turkish border. And uh, I, was, I had a friend there that day who was a very good pianist he, he was a classical pianist. We went to school together and he walked into the hotel with me and he walked straight up to this grand hotel, grand piano, and started playing uh, classical music. And in no time, there, there were about a dozen French girls that, that were, they, they were the people that were running the hotel, they all crowded around listening into Jack Fenton playing classical music. And they all, all the time, they wanted him to go to their homes and all this sort of thing. And I unfortunately went with him on one occasion, and that they also had a grand piano in their home. That was a French family. Uh, well, from there, of course, we went, we had to come back to Australia from, from uh, Lebanon. 
we first of all went back to Palestine for a month or so and then across to uh, uh, to the, a, uh, it was a port of the other side on the on the uh, on the low side of uh, the Mediterranean area there. That was uh, when we were boarded on to the Isle de France, which was a magnificent uh, French ship that had been beached backwards and forwards across the Atlantic in the earlier days. That took us to Goa in uh, uh, the west coast of India and we were dropped off there. That's the second 14th were from that ship and we were put on a little tramp streamer, uh, the city of Paris it was called. And uh, we were the only battalion on that because it couldn't accommodate more people. In fact, some of our battalion were left behind to get on other ships later. But uh, there was a, when we got out into the uh, seas towards Java, well, we were, there were a lot of other people going from that area to Java, but the early ships landed and they were all captured. But we had the, la the slowest ship that was in the convoy and we turned around just short of Java and we could hear the Japanese aircraft. Uh, they were being f f fought by the RAAF and RAF and American aircraft above where we were. There was a cloud bank, a big cloud bank, and that saved us from being identified by the Japanese aircraft because we would have been sitting ducks if they'd come down through the clouds. And I always believe in providence. And that's one time that uh, I was thinking that things are with us because no Japanese aircraft came through the massive cloud bank. And we were, took us a quite a time to get south into the Indian Ocean. And we could still hear the aircraft uh, above that was uh, engaged in warfare. But uh, we then went down into the middle of the Indian Ocean. We started to run short of water and, and uh, bread. And they, uh, they decided that we'd make a beeline for Fremantle. We had two ships there with us, the uh, uh, Cornwall and the Dorsetshire, two British warships that were with us that took us down. And one morning I always slept on the deck of every ship that I was ever on. The, I, my initiation into uh, that sort of thing was because when we got on the ship at, uh, in Sydney, the two chaps that were in the same birth as I was, uh, they, they both were never seen salt water before and they were very, very seasick with the word goes. So I, uh, I was always on the deck of that ship and every other ship. But this particular morning near Fremantle, uh, I could see all these flashing signals between ships and uh, the, the, the Australian uh, ship came in to sight and turned in its own length and went away from where we were. They came in to identify where we were and the Tornwall and the Dorsetshire, they moved off. Well, they went up the Andaman Islands and they were both sunk, both those British warships was sunk in the Andaman Islands, well, only probably a week later, bringing us back to Australia. 
uh, we we landed in Fremantle. A couple of the blokes nicked off and got on a train and came back to Melbourne before the, the battalion did. But then from there we went to Adelaide to the Colonel Light Gardens, which was a suburb of uh, Adelaide, and uh, that was a uh, well, it was a very hastily built camp of tents, but and, uh, well, quite a lot of Australian people in that area invited us to their homes. And uh, I remember two, two of the chaps that uh, I went with, one was a country boy and he didn't like ch chicken or chooks. And this lady had cooked this beautiful r r big uh, piece of uh, uh, poultry and he wouldn't eat it. <laughs> and we just, you know, he'd just come back from the Middle East and we were dying to have some roast roast chicken or something like that. And Lou, who was a country boy, Lou Waller, he, he wouldn't eat it, so she had to cook a chop for him, or a couple of chops. Uh, Lou Waller and I were very keen friends right through the Middle East and then up to New Guinea, and he lost his life in New Guinea. But uh, he, they were from Sale, uh, the Wallers, and uh, his girlfriend, that he had written to very rarely when we were in the Middle East. The chaps were very tardy about putting pen to paper. I wrote a lot of letters, many, many letters. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he asked her to come down to Melbourne when we got back to Melbourne. And we went around about four of the uh, jewellery shops and he bought a ring for her. Uh, an engagement ring, but she put it on her finger, but about, I uh, well, wouldn't have been more than three weeks later, Lou lost his life in New Guinea. You know, it was a pretty hard time for her, but we, I did never make any contact with her after the war, but one of our chaps did. Uh, I tried to get in touch with her a number of times down at sale, but uh, she probably married somebody else and then went away from the area. We had five days in Melbourne and then we went on a train that took us to Glen Ennis. And uh, uh, we were in Glen Ennis for, uh, or I would say, probably a week and then we were taken up to... Uh, Yandina, which is uh, north of Brisbane, and we were we were doing uh, well jungle jungle training. You had to go down to these valleys with a slasher, a machete, and just cut your way through. There was a thing growing in Queensland called Waiter Wall, and it was. Uh, it was a miniature bougainvillea in that uh, there were barbs everywhere on it. And to get through that area, through the bottom of these valleys, which we had to do for trading, uh, we'd have to slash your way through. That was, we'd, we had probably about a fortnight or three weeks in Yandina, and then we went south and got on the, uh, uh, the ship to take us to, uh, that was a Liberty ship, an iron ship, took us to New Guinea. The iron ships were very hot. Uh, you couldn't, you dare not put your hand on the iron ships. Uh, just like roasting they were when we got north. Uh, but then we had, uh, and a nice trip, uh, a very peaceful and uh, a trip up on on that ship to uh, Port Moresby. The the day before we got there, the, the uh, Japanese had bombed 
uh, Port Moresby, and there was a ship called the McDewey, which had beached itself on the other side of the harbour. Uh, that was a uh, that was a feature in the, that where you always looked across to the McDewey ship just sitting up there on on the uh, shore. And, uh, of course, it was stripped in no time of whatever was on it uh, by anyone that could get out of the ship. Uh, we uh, well, we we went north into the into the mountains, and uh, uh, our lieutenant and the lieutenant in the 14th platoon were both killed. Doctor, at least uh, Lieutenant Davis, he was killed on the 28th of uh, August, and uh, the 29th, our uh, lieutenant went across to the east side of the valley and that was uh, the Japanese were shooting in that direction mainly and that was the uh, 53rd Battalion was on the east side of uh, the valley, the, the Kokoda area or south, north of the Kokoda area it was at that time. But, uh, he went across to get these people out from the other side of the valley. Uh, uh, he was a New Zealander under the nose of the Japanese and he brought back these young boys uh, from the 53rd Battalion and they were, they were absolutely exhausted. They just sort of collapsed as soon as they got near our lines or behind where we were or just just along that along a track there it was uh, and then they were told to get up on their feet and walk back along the track as quickly as they possibly could because the Japanese were getting pretty fresh for their uh, with their gunfire uh, they were they were concentrating a lot of Japanese voices in the night. We could hear them talking and yelling in the night. Well, the following day, of course, we we had we were engaged with them. Well, we were engaged with them on the 28th. We no sooner got into our positions uh, at Isarava than they started firing on us because we were our section was on the skyline. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time, of course, that, but uh, we had to move down a little bit. Uh, but the, this chap was trying to shoot me all afternoon and uh, he hit, hit Matt Power. And Matt spun like a top and, uh, and then he went back to company headquarters and, uh, well, he went off then because quite a lot of chaps were, were injured or shot, wounded uh, at, uh, at that initial uh, operation against the Japanese or they against us. But uh, the, that was the afternoon of the 29th that uh, Bruce Kingsbury uh, with a brain gun shot a lot of chaps that had advanced further than there than they thought they had, and he he stopped the advance of the Japanese temporarily, but that night we, we had to move back to a position and our, our uh, remnants of uh, 15th platoon and 14th platoon, uh, we were taken over by uh, Lieutenant McElroy, who was actually the anti-aircraft uh, officer, but he, of course, was brought forward because we didn't have any aircraft there. Uh, he took over 22 of us, and uh, in the morning, you know, well, at, be, at daybreak, well, there were lots of Japanese between 
where we were as a standing patrol and that where the main bulk of the battalion was, which had moved back further. So we, we couldn't move back to the battalion because of the, well, probably a hundred Japs that were in that area. You could hear all the chat and whatnot. Uh, so we, we just uh, left it and McElroy decided we'd go uh, parallel with the battalion and try and keep in touch if we could, which we did three times at uh, Kargi, we met up with the Japs again, and at Fogi, and at, uh, uh, there's another place down south of that, or north, it was north actually at that time. Uh, the, uh, we were taken to this position by a uh, Seventh-day Adventist boy that came out of the woods and uh, Lieutenant McElroy said, well, can you direct us back to uh, where the troops will be? Because we'd gone out too far into the jungle area. And he took us, uh, probably he was with us for about oh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, take us to, and we was with us one minute the next minute he disappeared. And, uh, you know, we were talking, we were probably talking together, Bob McElroy and myself and others, and this chap just went into oblivion, no, nowhere there. So Bob McElroy said, uh, uh, well, somebody, can somebody uh, volunteer to go forward in this position? Well. I volunteered and Lou, Lou Wallet and another little chap, uh, Brown I think his name was, uh, they, they went to slightly to the uh, left and I went forward. Well, I, there are a whole lot of uh, tall boys from up in Rebel that were there about oh, 12 or 20 of these boys and I walked up to them and I said, where are the Australian soldiers? He said, Japanese soldier over there. <laughs> well, just the minute that I looked there, this chap was in a weapon pit and he had an Australian uh, round sheet over the top of his weapon pit and he had it on poles. Well, he tried to bring his gun over, but it got tangled in that. And I went down the, I went straight down the track towards the river. And uh, I then, there were a lot of Japs down at the bottom of that valley. They were taking up a, uh, uh, a mountain gun. They were, they, they were only a few Japs, but a lot of uh, the, the tall, tall, tall boys from uh, Rebel. Uh, I did a, I, I went into the right, into the uh, jungle area, and uh, decided I'd go back along the river towards where our people were. Uh, I'd gone back about, oh, I suppose a quarter of an hour, and then there was a, a lot of gunfire up on, further up on the, uh, the mountain area. And uh, there was a crash, crashy coming through the jungle, and it was uh, A.G. Roberts. Uh, he came through, and then I said to him, Well, we're going, we'll have to be on our own from now on. And uh, so we decided to go back in the direction we were coming, uh, going to. And uh, the first thing we came on was a grave. And we learned later that, that was uh, W.O. Uh, he was a B Company 
WO, he'd be shot and they'd bury, had time to bury him, which was unusual at the time. Well, we kept going back for five days. Uh, one day we were, we were sitting down uh, saying, he was saying, uh, Roberts was saying, we were in the wrong direction. Well, we couldn't, didn't know where you were because the cloud was on you all the time. And uh, we were sitting down, fortunately. Uh, neither, I, I gave my, my Tommy gun to Lou Wall uh, back where we left uh, the, our, our uh, platoon. Uh, I had. I said, "You cover me when I go forward." And anyway, I handed him that Tommy gun. That Tommy gun has got a, a history. When we were at Latani River in uh, Palestine, the English landed a group of uh, their soldiers on the south side of the Latani River. And the, and the French had it all taped there and they shot up a lot of them. And that one of them had, an Englishman, had this Thompson submachine gun and I, I grabbed it. I had a rifle but I took that and I took six, six uh, they had a 48 a magazine and six, 20s, and I grabbed them all and I put them in my kit and I had them right through uh, until we were up in, the, up in New Guinea. And uh, the first afternoon at, at uh, Isarava, I emptied the 48 barrels, 48 uh, shots into the Jap area. I got plenty of plenty of replies from that, from their, their gunfire. But uh, fortunately, I, I had, I could crawl up from where I was. I dare not stand up. Matt Power stood up and he got hit. So I had to crawl up to the, to the, the cause of nature caused me to go up, crawl up, and I went up to an area which was a slightly higher on the mountain, and there were uh, Don Company, some of our D Company were there, and they told me not to make a mess in their backyard. <laughs> that was a, you know, things like that happened in the army, and it's it's all quite comical when you think of, think of it later. But uh, when we were, uh, Roberts and I were in this area, Later, I said, freeze. And up on the hill, probably about 100 yards away, were Japanese. And they were armed, of course, and we were not armed then. Uh, they were walking and they heard voices, our voices, talking as it were in, in the right or wrong direction. But... Uh, we, uh, I just said to Roberts, freeze, and he, he had white hair. And I was like a Jap then because I didn't have, a, I had a heavy black beard on. Uh, and we, we did, we stopped and stopped talking. And just at that time, this is another time I believe in Providence, uh, turkeys. Scrub Turkey started to squabble. Just near where we were, we were sitting down, and these turkeys and the Japs were looking at, them and they said, "Oh, turkeys!" <laughs> but it actually was our voices that they had looked around at initially. So we we uh, we traced our steps, and on the uh, crests of all the valleys and all the hills. The Japanese used to put a, uh, a leaf facing in the direction that they were going. And they were about every 
or five yards, there'd be a leaf pulled off and put down facing on the track. They were very, very small tracks. You had to sort of push your way through some some areas, but they were the that was the area that, of course, the New Guinea people used to keep to the hills all the time. We probably followed those for a day at least, and then we came down onto the flat of the countryside and we had another day moving in the direction that we thought we should be. We couldn't hear any gunfire, I think. Uh, we came across a, uh, a 24th Battalion was a CMF unit from Sydney. They had left uh, a lot of uh, uh, bayoneted tins of food and uh, even kits, kits they had dropped. Uh, I picked up a kit that was, belonged to a lieutenant, and uh, uh, but we ate what we could of those. We hadn't eaten for thirteen odd days. We ate what we could in the in those tins. Some were uh, baked beans, some were spaghetti, and uh, there was the food that we never sort of had when we were in the army. We mainly on bully beef all the time. However, we did eat a little bit. Roberts ate fruit off a tree, which was like a plum tree, and we were told not to eat that, but he was very sick by eating just a half, half one of those pieces of fruit. But we then went forward in that direction in the valley and then we had came up to this area, which was a very high feature. And we knew we were in the right direction because of these, the troops of the 24th had gone back that way. You could see where they'd gone back in that area. We came across this very high feature. And uh, I said to Roberts, I said, uh, if there's any of our blokes up there, they'll shoot me because I look like a Jap. Anyway, he didn't, didn't want to, he was really blonde, white hair. He didn't go forward, so I was walking up the hill and then I, the next minute there's a whole hail of bullets went past my left ear. <laughs> <laughs> that mm. happened also back at Israel, I got a burst of machine gun fire just past my ear. But uh, however, I yelled out, stop Aussies, and this chap stepped out from an independent company and uh, said, sorry, mate, but uh, anyway, I was still alive and still walking. So they took us back. That was, uh, that was a very high feature overlooking a lot of the area. Uh, they took us back to where there were Australian troops, including our, some of ours, and I handed that haversack over to one of our officers uh, because I'd read a, read a couple of the letters in that haversack and it said a lot about sending about ships and people getting on ships, which I thought was pretty poor <laughs> for, to have up there on the, on, in New Guinea, but still, that's by the by. But uh, we were taken back and then we were taken further back and Davian Parra, who was a well-known uh, war uh, photographer. Sorry, what was his name again? Damien Parra, P-A-R-E-R. -E he, he joined the American forces later as a, uh, as a wartime photographer in the American Army during the campaign. But uh, he, 
I, I had got a lend of a, uh, a razor and because, uh, as I said before, I had a very heavy black beard, two, uh, two weeks at least, uh, and I, I shaved part of my face with the razor and Damien Power came up and, and there was another chap from the Argus, uh, who, uh, a uh, Hetherington, John Hetherington was a, uh, a correspondent, a war correspondent. He started to take a few notes of what I was talking about and Damien Power said, oh, you you wrecked it. I can't photograph your half black and half white. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, then we were taken back further uh, to uh, the second second CCS, which is a casualty clearing station. And I happened to know a nurse there who trained with my elder sister. Uh, Clara Smeary, her name was, and uh, well, and Beryl Ling. Beryl Ling is a, a Geelong girl. Uh, I had further contact with them further back in New Guinea, in uh, Port Moresby, because the CCS was moved down off the mountain down to this uh, Port Moresby. And they were integrated with the 5th AGH, I believe, down there. They were no longer the 2nd CCS. But uh, there were different falls uh, in, in, the, in the rivers in New Guinea. And one day we decided we'd have a, a swim in a pool uh, which was probably about 20 yards circular in the side of the mountain and uh, the water was rushing through this and one of our chaps got taken over the edge of them. That was the end of him because they, it was the water was so fast. Now, all, all we saw was this these arms and legs flying up in the air and that was it, finish for that particular chap. Self, his name was, S-E-L-F. Uh, but it was, uh, we then got down from, we were down there on the flat uh, in a uh, rehabilitation area. Some of our chaps were coming off the hill, off the mountain, and they had uh, scrub typhus. Well, scrub typhus is deadly. You got it if, if, if you lay down in kunai grass and uh, you could get scrub typhus. And this chap, Stevenson, Ivan Ralph, he had it badly. And uh, Clarice, Clarice Murray said to me, as one of your chaps here, uh, who's not, not too good. But when I went to see him, he just smiled at me. Uh, I, Stevenson, I R. He the slightest smile, he recognised me, but he passed away that afternoon, Clarence told me. He'd, he'd, uh, he lasted long enough to have uh, recognised somebody, which was good. But he in the Middle East, Stevens and I are, he liked hard liquor. And he always drank brandy or something really hard like that. And he used to get absolutely sozzled in the, in the Middle East. We, uh, we used to have to carry him to the uh, transport to take him back to camp every time. He just hit the, hit the hard stuff straight away. But, uh, when we were in the Middle East, uh, we went to a, uh, a, uh, a cafe run by the uh, Jewish fraternity. There were, there were always about four of us that went together. That was uh, Dossiter, Oliver Dossiter, 
Cameron Irvin, a chap by the name of White and myself. We went to various uh, restaurants in the, in the Middle East. They didn't like Gentiles going into their, their restaurants uh, very much because well, we were eating uh, their particular type of food, which was always very wholesome and uh, their, the steak was never steak like we know it. Every night in New Guinea when we were down there, the Japs used to fly over and bomb wherever they could. Uh, they weren't very accurate. Uh, the, most of the bombs landed in the, in the bay, Port Phillip, Port uh, Moresby Bay, uh, but there were 48 aircraft one on one raid the Japs made uh, there, and our, we had they we had some anti-aircraft guns up on a hill there. They they tried to do a little bit of uh, uh, right. uh, tried to do a little bit of damage, but. Uh, the, the Americans, uh, there were quite a lot of Americans there, ne Negroes driving big trucks uh, hither and thither. This particular one on the wharf, I was watching him from up the hill a bit and he raced backwards and forwards when the aircraft were above and then he ran up a hill which was about I'd say 45 degree angle. He just went up it like a like a monkey. It was a, it was off the wharf and up this hill and over the top and out of sight. It was quite amusing to see the antics of people under uh, those conditions when there were bombs flying there. They did hit a couple of ships there, but nothing to really sink them. There are a lot of luggers, of course, always in Port Moresby. Uh, the, uh, the New Guineans did a lot of fishing out, out on the reefs and things. And when I was there in that camp, uh, I tried to see my brother-in-law, who was in the Hunter's Bomber Squadron, and that was, that was I heard that that was out at Seven Mile Drone, which is now Jackson Aircraft, Jackson uh, Airdrome. And uh, they said the Americans had taken over the Seven Mile Drone. And uh, a brigadier said to uh, a chap there, uh, Major, uh, I'm trying to think of his name now, but uh, take him to the, uh, take him to uh, another airdrome further down near Moresby and see whether you could get him in touch with his, uh, the 100th Bomber Squadron. Well, uh, Grant, Grant Neds, his name was, an American major, Grant Neds from Missouri. And uh, we went to the, this first drone uh, and uh, it wasn't under the bomb and I said, oh, they've just built another one called Wygoni uh, out 20 or, 20 or 30 miles out from where we were. Uh, when we got out there, the Americans had... Uh, with these massive big uh, bulldozers, where how they got them there, I wouldn't know. But they'd carved each side of this, mount, these two mountains, and made a runway in between. When we were up in New Guinea, uh, the, uh, the the New Guinea uh, infantry NGI. Angau, A-N-G-A-U. They, they were operating before the war up there. Uh, this this uh, 
ch chap who was a, just a private citizen, but he brought a whole lot of uh, New Guinea boys forward to Israava when we were in Israava. And uh, they had mainly uh, bully beef and biscuits, but they also had uh, some ammunition. And uh, uh, Warrant Officer Lairs Tipton was the was the uh, the battalion uh, regimental sergeant major. He came up with them from Myola, where we were left Myola to go to Israava, and that's where they were dropping their stuff off, our DC three aircraft into the swamp near near the camp, but you had to go down into the swamp to get the packets of big tins of biscuits and, and whatever else you could from it when they were pushing them out of the aircraft. Well, they, uh, there's Tipton had these boys and this, this uh, gentleman uh, who brought these boys up with all this stuff and uh, he, he saw me over further. I'd just been put in a position by Lieutenant uh, Boddington to said he said, "Don't shoot. There's a I'm bringing through a group of uh, the 53rd Battalion through the jungle, so don't shoot." So I was on more or less on this position near and the. The track that went across to the valley, the other side of the valley, was quite a big track, well, say six feet wide. And I had a, I had a vision of the Japanese setting up a gun over, uh, over the valley on the other side and our, uh, uh, our mortar platoon, they... they got a direct hit on this gun when it was being assembled with the Japs. Well, they, uh, the Japs, I think one of the Japs had a telescopic uh, on his uh, telescope on his rifle because he shot quite a lot of our people through the head. And uh, that afternoon, they, they, they uh, sniper got uh, our uh, uh, the uh, mortar platoon lieutenant, who was uh, Bissett, Stan Bissett's brother, yeah, uh, Buff Bissett, they call him, or a name similar, something similar. To that. But he was shot by a sniper that afternoon, and there was another young officer from either. A company, I think he was, he got shot too. But anyone that moved at that time was, you know, you, it, it was it was curtains for you. But fortunately, I, they didn't ever get me. <laughs> I, I was one of, you know, I was just lucky. Yeah. Uh, lucky that I got away with it all that time. When people, each side of me, uh, 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 Nippon Jackson, who we call him Nippon, he looked looked by a bit like a nip, and uh, Bernard Bernard Carlson, they were both shot dead, and yet I, the machine gun fire that got them missed me. Amazing, and I was between them. Just <laughs> amazing. Uh, that was at uh, Israava. They both, you know, and uh, quite a lot of other chaps, of course, were shot at that area when the Japs really uh, got stuck into us. Armour was the uh, wing commander there at the time, and he said to me, it was about two, two o'clock in the afternoon, he said, uh, your brother-in-law, who was... Uh, Squadron leader Cliff Bernard was my brother-in-law. I'd never met him because my, my eldest 
sister married him when I was in the, uh, when I was in the army, and I just didn't get around to meeting him. Well, he said to me, "Is you in? He's overdue." He said, as a matter of fact, he should have come in by midday, but he hasn't. Well, I eventually found out that he was his aircraft was shot uh, and uh, put in a bad way uh, at Milne Bay by the Japanese air, uh, anti-aircraft guns, and uh, he ca- he took the the uh, aircraft along the south coast of New Guinea as far as he could, but then he had to ditch it. And he was badly wounded. He was bleeding, losing blood. I learned later from the other two members of the crew who managed to to get in onto dry land from the from the aircraft. Uh, it's Cliff Bernard. He was he died that day. That was the I think it was the twenty eighth of October. From there, I I didn't go back to the second fourteen. I joined a supply company, another unit. I first of all went to uh, a house that was on the on the uh, seaward side, and that was the headquarters of the uh, municipal officers, and they did have uh, lots of maps in there of even even the areas that we'd been moving through that were, had been uh, done in years gone by. Uh, the, uh, there was a, a, a sergeant there from Brisbane and uh, he was in a survey company Army survey, and I, I said, "Any chance of me joining your unit?" He said, "Well, I'll see." But they said that I, I would have been uh, uh, too. You know, I, I wasn't on their uh, list of uh, people, so I, I didn't didn't get into the that supply that uh, survey. I would have loved that to have been involved with that at the time. However, from where I was, I uh, I I was in Moresby a lot, and as I mentioned, we were having quite a lot of uh, aircraft raids. Uh, when one afternoon, Clarice Murray and Beryl Ling the two sisters from 2nd CCS, they they said, uh, uh, any chance of uh, getting us out near the McEwey, the McEwey, the ship that had been sunk, well, a couple of Americans, airmen that I had met, they got two... Uh, uh, two uh, uh, little uh, uh, little uh, motor cars, or I forget what they call them, those, uh, the, uh, the American uh, Jeep. They were Jeeps. And they they took us out to there. That was Clarice Berry and Beryl League and these two American airmen. And they, when we were out there, uh, they they had pistols and they they had the two girls firing at tins. That was Clarice and Beryl having a shot at the tins along the beach area. Well, that was a, a an unusual afternoon for me to have had in the army and knowing the people that were involved in it. Uh, another day, I managed to get on a, uh, a lugger with Clarice and Beryl 
they had a, an afternoon off and we, we went out fishing. There was a, it was a beautiful day, you know, very warm and very pleasant because there was, there was no wind and uh, it, was a, it had a motor which took us out over the reefs and things. We caught a few fish but it was more just relaxation of lying about on the deck and be taken and brought back. There were about, well, I suppose, six, six Aussies on that, that day we went out on the lugger. We had to, of course, recuperate the, uh, the uh, New Guinea boys for use of their boat and... Uh, and uh, for taking us out. But that sort of thing didn't happen very often, very, very rare. I went for, with that company to uh, Moratai and, uh, and uh, Hal Mahera's, which is an island just across from Moratai. Uh, while we were there, the, uh, the Japanese had capitulated by that time. Uh, and uh, I was uh, I was uh, selected to go to the Philippines to a prisoner of war reception group. There were 22 of us on it. Most of them were officers, a major, and uh, the, our brigadier was Brigadier Wrigley. Uh, and we were getting people out of uh, Manchuria uh, that, that were officer prisoners, and we also had some Aussies came out of Tokyo and other areas of Japan. But uh, the ones that came in from uh, Manchuria, uh, one of them was Colonel uh, Ken Hughes. Well. He was a, he, uh, the brigadier said to me, you've been in the service for quite a time and he wants to talk to somebody. He hadn't talked to anyone about the war for a couple of years, being incarcerated by the Japs. So I went into his tent at about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Colonel Kent Hughes, and we talked till about four o'clock the following morning uh, about what had happened to me and the, the war generally. And fortunately, I, I had uh, uh, Mrs. Rogers, who was the wife of the dean of Melbourne University. She used to write to me. She was a friend of my mother's. And she kept me up to date with politics quite a bit which was quite unusual, but that's what she did. And I could hand him over a couple of my letters from Mrs. Rogers uh, to Colonel Kent Hughes, and he was absolutely enthralled <laughs> to think that I, I was carting around some letters like that. Uh, but she was reg uh, a regular correspondent with me. Those letters still in existence. Uh, because when I came back, uh, my mother had kept all the letters I'd written, and uh, and I had uh, they were box boxes of uh, letters from different people that had, I'd written to and got letters back from. Uh, in uh, uh, they were shoe bo shoe bo boxes. Well, they, I think my daughter's got those now. She's, she's uh, going to do something about that. Uh, but uh, they were under the house. I had them under the house for years and years. But uh, now they're back in existence again. Uh, we, uh, with Kent Hughes, I had another session with him uh, about a day later, and then they, the senior officers flew out 
there are quite a number of uh, majors. Now, most of the people that came in were Australian, uh, English, uh, one Canadian. Uh, he was, uh, I think he was an airman, the, the Canadian. And when we were there, uh, Brigadier Wrigley said, are there any Freemasons amongst you people? And I put my hand up and there were, the, this Canadian, he was a Freemason, and, and uh, Andrew, uh, my, he was a captain in the Scottish, a Scottish battalion, uh, Fairbairn, Andrew Fairbairn. Captain Andrew Fairbairn was a, a prisoner of war with the Japs, and uh, he was a Freemason, so we went to the first Masonic meeting. Uh, the Japanese had absolutely desecrated the uh, temple, the Free, uh, Freemason temple, smashed it to smithereens. But uh, there were there were four palace, four uh, Filipinos there, and they were. They were having a, a great argument about who handed the list of the the uh, Freemasons over to the Japs, and they came to the conclusion that it was it was a uh, Roman Catholic priest actually, because they they had been buried in the St Thomas's uh, Hospital grounds, the the list of uh, Freemasons, well, the Japs went round and they beheaded every every Freemason they could lay their hands on. What, what, but, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Why were they so, um, why so, were they so virulently against the Freemasons? What was it the Japanese? Well, the Japanese, uh, anything that was a uh, something of that nature, would be targeted by the Japanese, and of course, every nearly everybody in uh, in uh, the Philippines is a Roman Catholic. There was one chap there uh, who was a Spanish Spanish uh, man. Uh, he he was a he was a doctor. And he was shot because he decided he wanted to start Freemasonry in in the Philippines. We were really well looked after by the uh, Americans. They had all sorts of food that we never had. Ice cream was a big thing with the Americans, always the ice cream. 